Hello. Is that there? So it doesn't interfere with the old uh, volume. And we'll just. Uh, Pardon me. I'm going to just sort of uh, sit here for a moment. Having a little. So, bring me your cups of teas. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Hello, CJF. Nice to see you. Good morning to all four of you. Morning Ian, morning, morning Roman. Morning Mr Kendrick. I'll have a chat to you in a minute. Well, nice day out there. All the traffic stopped. A lot of people staying at home. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. A lot of people staying at home there is. Hello, Soundwave man. I hope you're well. I hope each and every one of you are okay. I know you was having a few issues before all this hit. So I hope you're okay. Hello, Chris. How are you, mate? I hope you're well this morning. Been out and done your shopping. <laughs> Hello, Andrew. It's John. Hello, John. How's your treatment going, mate? You doing all right? Nice to see everybody. It makes a change in the day, doesn't it? Just sort of pop in, say hello. Hello, Angela. Shopping two days a week now. We did our first one online last night. I got an email from Sainsbury's telling me that I'd been added to their vulnerable list so I could make one order a week. So we made a shopping order last night. So we'll see how that goes. That's supposed to come on Friday. And there's Judith. Hello, Judith, my love. And Popcoin. Hello, Popcoin. And Nanny Sue. And there's Angela. Oh, yes, yeah, Angela. I've said hello to Angela. So everybody's in, look at that, 13 people in. Lovely, lovely. Bit of subliminals. Hope everybody's got their own cups of teas. Have you got your cups of tea? Are you ready? So the first thing I'm gonna talk about, you got your coffee, have your popcorn? The first thing I'm going to talk about, I've put in a title, Legal, Moral, Right. I've said this before, haven't I? That you get circumstances, especially insolvency, bankruptcy, whatever, or business, whatever, and sometimes there is a choice to make, and you can choose to make the choice, to, the right thing to do, you can choose to do the moral thing, or you can choose to do the legal thing, and they don't always they're not always the same. So, for example, I don't know about legal, and I'm not too sure about moral, but the right professional thing to do for every email that you get is to answer it. That is the right professional thing to do. And I'm just making this point because I'm letting everybody know, here and now, that emails like this, I don't care if the right thing to do is to answer it. I don't care if that's a professional thing to do. As far as I'm aware, it's not legal that I have to answer every single email. And from a morality point of view, I'm looking after my own morality. So when I get emails like this, they're not going to be answered. They're just going to be pinned. So who am I talking to? I'm talking to people like James Kendrick. 
I know you're watching James, you watch every single video that I do. And this is one of the people that was so nasty when I was ill and, uh, and at a point where, and I've said it before, but you know, at a point where everybody thought I was dying, this is one of the people that was like nasty. And his email is, is this fat lardar still eating fancy Marks and Sparks cakes and biscuits when 80 stroke 90 year old pensioners is in his 80s? And I normally have so much respect for the older generation, I really do. But you know, sometimes you have to say, hang on a minute, I know there's this respect for the older generation, but the fact that you're 30 years older than me means that you've got 30 years more experience. 30 years, man. 30 years you've lived on this planet more than me. You should have a little bit more decorum about it. You should have a little bit more politeness about it. You should have a little bit more decency about it. When 80, 90 year old pensioners can't get any basics like bread, milk and potatoes, no wonder his gut droops over his dick and there he is talking about nasty scropes, because I mentioned about nasty scropes on a video last week. Fat lardars, that was the uh, subject line. This subject line, God what a thick cunt, spelt K-A-N-T, for those of you that thought they misheard me. And uh, God you are as thick as chicken, I don't know what that's supposed to say. Is that supposed to say S-H-I-T? I don't know. But Then I get another one. I bet the Royal Mint and 288 are pissing themselves with laughter coming up against a terminally stupid tosser like you. Muffin top lardy ass boy doesn't know how eggs are fertilised. I think that was in reference to that conversation I was having with Butch that day over eggs. What a thick, embarrassing CNUT. What chance would you have up against a professional brief? Probably tie him up in knots. Anyway, I imagine you've blown all the money the poor stupid punters have invested to fight the court case on weed, wine, scotch, and lard ass cakes and biscuits. Not quite content with that he sends me that one again which is the one about calling me a large ass and all the rest of it he sent it again I don't want to send it twice <clears throat> another one bites the dust go and lock yourself away in a dark padded room with loads of single malt and skunk not the ones three arch has and think about I don't know what I meant by that and think about your stupidity a man of your age with no money reserves, no house. I'd paid off my mortgage at your age and started buying a second house that I rent out. You're nothing special, just a stupid ex-fairground barker, just another member of the Tits Up Club for the third time. I'd laugh, but it's not right to mock the stupid. As someone else mentioned, you are the author of your own stupidity and arrogance. James <clears throat> A.K.A. Jimmy. Even my grandson has more common sense than you. You know, I, I'm only holding it up to the screen so you know that I'm not just, you know, giving you a load of old waffle. And that sort of goes back to the time where it seems to me that I have to almost prove everything that I have to do, I say or do. Yeah, so, you know, uh, this is the only reply you're going to get from me, James. I don't care. I don't care. You see, stuff like that, emails like this, stalkers like this on Facebook, people like that, 
what was it, that change range and that bloke there, I wish I could remember his name now, that I've fallen out with for over a year, and that Lisa and all the rest of it, in them raw mint groups, stalking people, you know, people doing like what this person does, and they, they give it all this, and they give it all this, and they give it all this, and then they forget one day that they've tripped up, and they've tripped over that line, that line that says up until that line, everything that they do or say is legal, and they're quite they're quite within their rights to go shouting their mouths off. And then all of a sudden, they're so busy shouting their mouths off, and they're so busy pointing a finger and going, you're so bad, you're so bad, like that Lisa and that change range and this bloke, James Kendrick, right? So busy, so busy. And then all of a sudden, oops, oh, I've tripped over the line of legality and I haven't even noticed. Now I'm the one who's the criminal. Now I'm the one who's making all the illegal moves and I'm having a go at this bloke and all this bloke's trying to do is run a business. You know what I mean? What's the matter with these people? You know, and, and these people, there are people out there that would kill themselves, that would take their own life, gone, because of evil, nasty people like him and them. That ain't me. I just, I, I, I do it nice and easy. I, I do it like this. Look, this is what I teach. I teach this for bullies. I go, boom, 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 boom. There we go. No answer. Now, the right thing to do might be to give that person an answer. Well, I have. But I couldn't give a monkeys. This is this is a this is one of those areas that I've walked into where I actually don't care. Me personally, Ian Lambert, human being, I do not give a rat's ass whether my action right there on this video right now is legal, moral, or right. I actually don't care. If I've just done something illegal, I don't care. <clears throat> And I would, to my own embarrassment, stand up there in a courthouse and say that to the judge. I'm sorry, I don't care. Well, that was out of order and I wasn't putting up with that. So I don't care. Find me, do we like, I don't care. I'm not having that. Might be immoral what I've just done. Don't care. Don't care, call me immoral, don't care. So these, you know, now, I mention this because it leads me into something else, as usual, but I just want people to know, I want people to know that watch these videos and don't comment. And I want these people to know all over that have anything to do with us and, and whatever. I want people to know, yes, I may owe you some money. And, and, and this guy, actually, as far as I'm aware, we don't owe you a single penny because we've dealt with your nasty emails over and over and over again. And John assures me that you were refunded through the bank. So if you would missed that, because you haven't noticed it, because you've been too busy doing this, instead of looking at your... It's not my fault. And, even if, by some remote possibility, John is wrong, in some way, because he's made a mistake, having a go at me like that, why, why would you have a go at me like that? Why are you not just replying to John and saying to John, look, I haven't been refunded and let's talk about this. Instead of sending all this nasty drivel, it is just drivel. And when you look at the bloke's Facebook account, which I have I checked into him, I searched him on Facebook. I don't know, he gives you that impression with the posts that he puts up that he's a bit on the bit on the national front side, you know what I mean? That's what it seems to me anyway. Soundwave man says, this is what the government want, people pitching against people when the government are to blame. Same, I have much respect for the elderly, but James K is clearly a nasty, toxic individual. Maybe he's not well, I don't know. I mean, 80 odd, you know, Popcoin says, Kendrick, there's more important things going on in life and more important things to think about than you. 
If the police did no better things to do, that's where I'd be sending it, says Nanny. Angela says, wow, I feel sorry for the man. He must be very lonely and sad old man that has nothing to do in his life and pick on people that he's obviously jealous of. Soundwave man says, James Kendrick, a lucky OAP with a second name. And guess what? You can't take it with you, James. Not lucky, I mean ungrateful. <laughs> yes, and all the uh, sound comments. You know, what people like you, James, you, you need to wake, wake up one day and realise is you get a whole lot further in life if you just talk. Just talk. Now, let me give you an example. I owe so many people money. Oh, do I owe some people money. I mean, how much money do I owe? How many people do I owe it to? Well, it would probably be easier to come up with a figure that I don't than it is that I do. In other words, it's a bloody lot. And I know this. What was I going to give an example of? Done it again, and I. Hello, Ailey. What was I going to give an example of? What did Bob Hoskins say? I know you're asking for a quote there, but I can't think of it. But Bob Hoskins is one of my favourites, I must say. But anyway, I was going to, um, I forgot where I was for a second. But anyway, it was leading me on. So, so the government has, as relax the laws on uh, oh yeah i was talking about owing all of you lot money that's what i was talking about that was yeah one of my examples so owing all you lot money so um so i owe all of you lot money i know that well not all of you but most of you money now there's a couple of ways of dealing with this there's a legal way there's a right way there's a moral way. And up until a few days ago, the legal way is to just stop. Everything stops. It gets put all over there into the corner and then it all gets gone through page by page by page, line by line, name by name, figure by figure, all added up, what the debts are, who they are, everything. That's how it's done legally. That's the legal stance. Can't do anything about that. That's the legal stance. However, to build in safeguards to make sure that directors of companies and owners of companies like me don't come in and just rake the ass out of all the money and take all the money and do things like buy myself a sports car or a Stradivarius guitar, violin, whatever it is, or a, or a boat or a whatever, right? or a solid guard wheelchair, or whatever. So there's rules in place to make sure that, you know, you're supposed to act properly, do the best that you can, do everything you can legally to make your business work, etc., etc., and not do anything knowingly wrong. There are rules in place for all of that. Now, all of a sudden, those rules have been relaxed. So, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna explain to you I'm going to explain to you in layman's terms because you will have heard this on the news the same as I have and I've had some of you contacting me going Ian does this affect you well it does and it doesn't the the mainly what they're talking about first of all for insolvencies and one, one thing over is directors and limited companies and businesses in that sense which we're not I'm a sole trader I never went down the limited company route nearly but didn't so what they're talking about mostly at the moment is for limited companies, that kind of thing. But the important thing about the rule that they've relaxed is that they have relaxed the very serious rule about the limitations and personal liabilities of the directors. Now, I know a lot of you don't understand what that really means. So that's why I'm explaining it now in layman's terms. So in layman's terms, before they relax the rules, 
if I'd have gone out and bought myself a, I drive a Safira, by the way, and our Safira is about four or five years old, six years old, somewhere in that region, right? A new Zafira is 25 grand-ish. So supposing I'd gone out before they'd made this announcement last week, I'd gone out and bought myself a brand spanking new 25 grand car and I, and I shouldn't really have taken that money out of the pot because there wasn't enough profit there. I took the money out of what really should be business money and I've gone and spent it on a 25 grand car. So before they made these announcements, get into a lot of trouble for that. That's very naughty, you shouldn't do that. After they made these announcements, since last week, now mm, you're not really gonna get into trouble. Right? Okay, so uh, how do we put it another way? Limited company, directors, use company money to fund trips, go to strip clubs, uh, buy each other watches, um, whatever, whatever. Think of a, a waste of company money that shouldn't happen, blah, 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 but, but might, right? You think of a scenario yourself, and any scenario you can think of, and think, well, that's wrong, yep, it's wrong, and there are rules in place, naughty, 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 and you can get in trouble, you can even go to prison. They've relaxed those rules now. But now, you're not gonna get in trouble as much. So what does that mean? Again, in layman's terms, it means that you're now gonna get more and more companies go bust. They will go bust on purpose. And the very first one, and I was waiting for it to happen, was Bright House. Bright House is a disreputable company anyway. They have been sent to the cleaners. Bright House is one of these companies that you find on the high street and you only find this type of company pop up on the high street in times of when there's not a lot of money around, when when the economy's going down and people haven't got a lot of money, like gold shops, they suddenly appear everywhere, we'll buy your gold, right? When people have got money, these places close down because nobody wants to sell their gold. So um, anyway, Bright Shops is one of them. They, get, they, they start up in business all across the country, a bit like cash converter type thing, except you, you don't go in and sell anything to them. You go in and you buy it. You buy a new three-piece suite, a TV, whatever, but you buy it all on the knock, all on the weekly and it costs you double, three times what it's actually worth, right? It's one of them kind of companies. It's a Wonga kind of company, but they sell goods. And so, you know, for the, for the, for the 2,000 pound sofa, three piece suite, you're paying 3,500 pound or whatever, 4,000 pound or 5,000 pound, whatever. But people shop with them because the people that shop with them are the people that can't get the credit in furniture land to buy a 2,000 pound sofa on interest-free credit and therefore only pay 2,000 pounds. No, these are the people that are skinned, that have got county court judgments, that have got bad credit, that are whatever, whatever. So the only place they can go is a place like Bright House where they can get whatever they want to get, new sofa, new telly, new chair, new cooker, new whatever they need, they can get it, but if it's going to cost them two thousand pounds worth, they ain't going to get it on interest-free credit. They're going to pay back about four grand for it, or whatever, right? So there's a lot. There is a lot of questionable activities going on within the Bright House Group, which means that the buck for that stops at the director level. These are the people that run the business. Right, director level is my level, that's the people that run the business. And the law has just been changed to allow them to go bust without any personal director's responsibilities. Now that is the other, that is the, you know, again, they've brought this new, new rule out, this new law, they've relaxed it a bit. And so whenever you do that, you create a this, Right, and then you have, whatever that is that you've created, you have an extreme and extreme. You have one extreme to the other and everything in the middle. And on this new rule, you know, one of the extremes to this new rule is that a company like Bright House, now is the right time for them to go bust. The moment they make that rule, 
go bust. Come on, lads, go bust. Now's the time. We can't get done. Let's go back. Let's go bust. It'll all get wound up and we're safe. So that is a bad side of what they've just done. Now, a lot of, um, <clears throat> a lot of, uh, what was I going to say? Leave me a minute to get me thoughts again. <clears throat> right, so the others and new parameters and all that is that whatever parameter you bring out, you're going to have an extreme. You're going to have the one at the beginning that just comes inside the line there, and you're going to have the one at the other end of the extreme that just comes inside the line there. And as I say, you're going to have everything in, 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 in the middle. So essentially, every single one of these new rules and whatever is open to interpretation and it's open to various interpretations. And even now, daily, over the last couple of weeks, they argue these interpretations, if you watch it, on, on the House of Commons Live. The House of Commons is live every day and every new rule that you hear them come out with at five o'clock, they've, they've done that over the last few days in, in the House of Commons. That's where they're ratifying it, that's where they're arguing the points. That's where he says, right, we're going to make this rule and then someone else will get up and say, well, hang on a minute, if you're making that, does that include this or does that include that? And they pick it to pieces, right? <clears throat> Excuse me. And then it eventually gets to wherever it gets to for the five o'clock briefing that day or the next day. And some of that, what's been done, comes out. So if you watch any of their mouses of Commons, you'll see them debating some of this. So and open to interpretations and there are people like the bright house directors who will see and interpret exactly as i've just given it to you take it as an easy way out and go for it because they are now looking after number one and they are now looking after them and theirs which means they have to look after their wives their children their bank balances their houses their yachts their cars and all the rest of it right and so, boom, now's the right time to go liquidation. Now, I sort of see something a little bit, I see that from a, from a personal level. It's so easy, I, easy for me to just go, you know, and I won't even have to do a fraction of the paperwork that I would have had to do before all this happened. But see, that's too easy. And I don't normally take the easy way out, but that's too easy. And, um, and I would feel too cowardly doing that you see legally remember all three don't always mix they don't always go together right sometimes they do and sometimes they don't so the legal thing for me to do is to just box it all up hand it all over and say bye bye and then just sign on universal credit and try and start my life again along with everybody else that is the legal thing for me to do and not lose a moment's sleep over it. That's the legal thing for me to do. And go to bed every night and just not ever, 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 ever bother about it ever again. <clears throat> Never do another video. Don't do anything, don't even bother. Just, um, just start gardening and putting plants out the front and selling them. Go into a completely different line of business. That is 100% legal. And that doesn't exactly sit right with me. So you have a difference between what's legal, what's right, and what's moral. Now, before they made a change to the insolvency rules and therefore put up a section, a new section, that can have a couple of extremes, everything in between, and also be negotiated upon, and what was the word I used? Um, uh, interpreted in a myriad of different ways. I'm looking at that. So, so I see, okay, what I could do is, I could, um, 
I could look at these rules a little bit differently and I could look at these rules and interpret them as if a person wanted to try a little bit, if a person wanted to keep trying, then perhaps they'd be allowed to. I sort of see it a bit like that. I see it that if you make the wrong decision, which before would have been classed as illegal, like the Bright House boys, and you make that decision now, we won't slap you as much as what we would have done a week ago. So that led me to the idea of going yesterday, I'm going to take somebody and I'm going to, I'm going to try my best to take somebody every day and sort one of you out. Now, yesterday, I picked on Judith, if you remember, and I said, I'm going to try and sort Judith out. And I, me and Judith, we got talking yesterday and after the show, and we managed to come to uh, an agreement, an arrangement, and I think Judith is on here now, so she'll be able to say. And, um, and we've come to an arrangement, and her parcel should be picked up today, because it said today, and delivered to her on Friday. And that's me and Judith clear. And that's me and Judith square. Don't owe Judith a penny. That parcel sorts that out. I can do that because I've managed to do it by courier. So that's me and Judith square. What I'd like now is I'd like either Ailey or Nanny Sue to put a thumbs up. That's all. And then whichever one of them two puts a thumbs up, that's who I'm going to do next. I'm going to sort them out next. So whichever one of you is watching, that I caught you on the up there, stick a thumbs up. Ailey, Nanny Sue, was you paying attention? Or was you watching a flipping Good Morning Britain? Yeah, not you, Popcoin. Didn't I didn't mention your name, Popcoin? <laughs> you hang on a minute. I'm looking after the girls first. Okay, so we've got Nanny Sue there. Right, Ailey was in the background. So, and I'm not, you may, yeah, before you say, all right, start taking a list, make a list, put me on it. No, I'm not doing that. I'm not going to do that. And there's a couple of reasons I'm not going to do that. First of all, oh, Robocop, Robocop, pay attention. <laughs> so, here's why I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do this in a relaxed way to me, a non-stress-free way. You were begging for a thumbs up, so I advise. Thank you, Popcoin, but pay attention. It's not what I asked for. So, um, well, I did, but I didn't. Now I've lost my train of thought again. See, I've done it again. Oh, yeah, so I'm going to do it in a relaxed way, right? And... Um, <laughs> And shut up, Popcorn. And uh, I'm going to do this in a relaxed way for me. Right? It's got nothing to do with what's right and wrong and legal and everything in business. This has got to do with what's right for me, personally. Because everybody at the moment is off there looking after number one. I get that. Disarms me to a little bit. But I get it. I understand it. And, and I don't mind looking after people before I look after myself. But to a degree, I do have to look after myself. Now, I haven't stopped work at all. Not at any point have I stopped work. Saturday, Sunday, every single day, I get up and I do work. I'm changing things around. There's a show jump. More stuff has disappeared out there. See? There was, a, there was some other stuff there. It's gone. So I've got a complete business to reorganize, to change, to adapt, to evolve, to morph, to go bust, to wind up. Don't know yet where anything's going to go and don't know yet what, what's going to happen, etc. But what I do know is that the rules have been relaxed. And because the rules have been relaxed, I think I can do the moral thing, which previously would be considered 
to be an illegal thing. Now, the reason why this would be considered to be illegal is because it would be, I just made yesterday, Judith, a preferential creditor. That's what I've done. That is the result of the decisions that I've made. By satisfying Judith, I've made Judith a preferential creditor. And when I satisfy Nanny Sue, that makes Nanny Sue a preferential creditor. Now, before this crisis, that act alone is illegal. That, that act is illegal to the point where it could give me a prison sentence, could even give you a prison sentence, because you're not allowed to be a preferential creditor. I believe that because the rules have been relaxed and because the people that I'm trying to, to, uh, to sort out are just ordinary, lowly, if you like, members of the public, as opposed to trying to make the water board a preferential creditor or trying to make MNI a preferential creditor or HMRC a preferential creditor. I don't suppose they'll like it, but, but before, the act of making somebody a preferential creditor is absolutely bang illegal. You're not even allowed to, my wife, for example, has, has lent me money before now. If I go bankrupt, the law says I have to put the debt that I owe her down on a bankruptcy. And you're not allowed to say, oh, yeah, love, but later on, six months later, oh, yeah, love, here's a few quid back. Yeah, mum, yeah, bruv, whoever you borrowed it from. You're not allowed to do that. You're not allowed to pay them back, just like you're not allowed to pay back the electric board. You have to treat every single debt exactly the same. And the way that they treat every single debt the same is you take a pound and then the official receiver would divide that up and say everybody gets one penny in the pound or whatever. So that when uh, 500 quid comes in, the official receiver divvies it all up and he sends everybody a check for a pound or one pound 50 or 20p or five pound 60 or whatever it is. That's the way it's done. So under normal rules, to do what I've just done to, with Judith would be illegal. And to do what I'm about to do with Nanny Sue would also be illegal. And to do it with any one of you that I'm intending to do it with would also be illegal. So um, what I should have done was said this yesterday to Judith because I need to give you the option. Now I think we can get away with it. I think it's a bit of a stroke. It's what you'd call a bit of a stroke in business. I'm pulling a stroke. I'm pulling a fast one. I'm, I'm not put that in any other terms other than that. I am literally pulling a fast one. I'm pulling a fast one based on the rules that they've now bent themselves and I'm using those rules to mine and your advantage. So I'm pulling a fast one. I'm exploiting what they've just put up for our benefit. Now I say our benefit because if I write a list down of people, then I've got to deal with all of those people, one after the other after the other, and it is then a bucket load of stress. I don't want a bucket load of stress. I don't want to look at a list. I don't want to get up in the morning and see a list. That's my selfishness. No. That will stress me out too much. I will worry about it too much. Whereas if I just take a person like now, I'm taking Nanny, and Nanny, you can you you can say I should have given Judith the option yesterday, but I imagine she would say no. Send it to me anyway. Um, but you have the option of saying no, pass me over because I don't want to take the risk. Because at the end of the day, I have to say there is a teeny weeny weensy bit of risk. Because if I'm wrong, then they will come back and they will chastise me and they will want to chastise you. I don't think that would happen. I think what will happen is, in the grand scheme of things, with so many businesses going bust and so much paperwork and one thing or another, I just think they will, even if they think what I do, what I'm doing is wrong, I think they're li liable to just give me a slap on the wrist, if anything. I could go to prison for it, and I'm prepared for that. But, um, but that would be the worst case scenario. Absolute worst case scenario is I get done for making people preferential creditors and I go to prison. But then I would draw them, I will 
you know, hopefully present this particular video as evidence and say, this is what I did. I explained it up front. I told everybody what I was doing and, um, and I made my decision and then I then went with that decision, right or wrongly. So that is, but that is the way it is. You know, the law's the law. And we have such a thing as there's no, there's no excuse for, for, for ignorance. In other words, you can't say, I didn't understand the law or I didn't know about the law. Our law says you can't say that. It doesn't matter that you didn't understand it. it. doesn't matter that you didn't know about it. What matters is it's the law you should have known. But the law hasn't changed yet, says Zootikus. Uh, the law hasn't, well, no, I, I, I don't know what laws have changed and what laws haven't changed, and I don't profess to. What I am saying is they have now relaxed the laws, the insolvency laws and the bankruptcy laws a bit. They've just done that. This is my interpretation of it. That's all I'm saying. Your interpretation, Mr. Zootikus, might be different to mine from what you've watched. We can all of us only make decisions based on the information we have to hand at the time. And I'm basing it on all the information that I've had so far. So, uh, I have social services coming here anytime now, so I will have to switch you off. And then, so if I disappear, I'll ring you in to clarify anything I missed. That's fine, Nanny, just send me a text. Uh, I might be busy, but just don't call me just yet, but just send me a text for now. Uh, and then I'll, I'll answer you when I can. Uh, but you crack on. Regarding those sorts of laws, it's a bit of a free-for-all, to be honest. Yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, you know, there are 21 of you in here, and if I was to ask a question, I'd probably get 12 different opinions. A couple of you would have the same opinion, you know. So... There are, no problem, Nanny. So I'm going to be sorting Nanny out next. Um, and then I will put a call out another day once I've sorted Nanny out. I'm not saying I'm going to manage to do one person every day. But once I've managed to sort Nanny out, then I will open it up again. And we will take somebody else. Now, I'm, I'm doing it this way for a couple of reasons. And I will be perfectly honest about my reasoning for doing it this way by doing it this way those of you that are watching me now that are sitting there thinking but you owe me money too that means that you are going to keep a watch on these streams because it means you're going to want that back and if there's a way of getting that back you're going to be putting your thumbs up to that so you're going to be watching and you're going to be waiting now, it may be that when you get it, you get it and you don't come back to the stream again. Yeah, okay, I, I get that that's a possibility. But for the moment, it keeps, A, it keeps people watching the stream, which is good. It gets the word out, which is good. And other people that aren't necessarily watching the stream that I might owe money to may start now coming into the streams themselves. That sounds like I'm blackmailing people to come into the stream. It's not. It's about... If I take a certain action, that might happen, that might happen, and that might happen. If I take a different course of action, that's going to happen, and that's going to happen. For example, if I take the course of action of, I will just pick names at random and start dealing with those people, and those people are not the people that are watching the streams, then the people that are watching the streams are going to say, but we're here every day, I'm here every day, and you ain't sorting me out. No, that's out of order. So I will be offending someone somewhere, somewhere along the line. Don't matter what I do. And that's okay. I'm quite happy to offend a couple of people if that's what it takes in order to complete the job for the most part. Directors of companies can pay staff and suppliers even if there appears the company could become insolvent. Legislation which would retrospectively apply from the beginning of March will be introduced at the earliest opportunity. Exactly. And all I have to do is exercise a bit of patience. As I've been saying to you right from the get-go on this, it's so fluid it's going to change and change and change and change. They're going to bring one compensation out after another, after another, after another. What about the people that go, 
that have to sell their stock cheaper than what they paid for it in order to pay off bills and stuff like that whilst they're going bust. As Andrew says, you can, can't please all the people all the time. And you can't, I've tried. You know, I've, we, 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 we tried that. We went through a period of like, no matter what anybody says, we'll, we'll, we'll go with that customer's right all the time. No matter what they say, John, let's do that. Let's just do that for a while and see what happens. And it, it didn't make much difference. It didn't make any difference. Um, <clears throat> so so this, is, this is the way that I'm gonna do it. Right or wrongly, this is the way that I'm gonna do it. There's no point me talking about doing this and then sorting out the opposite people that I'm talking to. You know, might as well concentrate on you lot first. And, and then, because you know, you lot are the ones that are the hardcore, in and in here every day, on social media all the time, etc. So as and when you all get sorted out, you'll be telling other people and the word will get around. And then hopefully uh, we, can, we can start pulling a few things back. Are we likely to still go bust? Yes, I think so. I think we're likely to be finished as a business as the Great British Coin Hunt. I don't think the Great British Coin Hunt will come back from this. But <clears throat> what it depends on now is what money I raise over the next year, what we do, and how well I manage to sort out all the customers that we've got without any staff. Because there's no one else here now, it's just me and I'm trying to deal with it all, for the most part. So uh, things are gonna take a lot longer to do, things are gonna take me longer to get round to, stuff like that. Um, anybody that has an interest in stamps and wants to take stamps for what I owe them, they can. I've actually got a load of unfranked stamps that I didn't realise I had. I thought I'd got rid of them all, but I've got a shed load down there. Second class, first class, all sorts of stamps. All unfranked. As you know, I stopped using them because they cottoned on to me. And it cost me too much money. But, you know, that's something else I can trade in. Then we've got the stamps that I had up for sale, even though they were unfranked, but they're old ones. So, you know, they have a value of a couple of quid each to people, just, just as fillers when they're you know when they when they're looking for one and they ain't got it can't find it so things like that so that's uh, <clears throat> that's my plan what's what my plan is with investors the serious investors the ones that have put money in as investments and things like that I can't pay any of those people out right now and and I wouldn't be allowed to unless I had the money Pay them out, which I haven't got, so I can't pay them out. Um, so they've got to wait till the end, or they've got to wait longer. Nothing I can do about that either. But I will still try and still do my best. I don't know whether or not there'll be any kind of claims I can tap into or anything else. But if I get if I get things. If I get the money raised for the Royal Mint Fund, then I'll be getting them paid out of that. So um, I have no doubt that I, I still believe that there is a chance that everything can get paid still, because I still believe in that fight with the Mint. Even though I do commend the Mint very much for the fact that they've now started making face masks, well, not face masks, protective masks, visors for NHS staff. They're now making them visors. Um, and they've got a production gut line going on that at the minute. So well done to the men for that. But I shall still attack the men and I shall still attack Ian Glenn and 2AA group non-stop. And for that, the other idea of having um, posts and getting people to share a post, that idea is starting to work. And we've got... Um, Across, across the board, if you add them all up together, we've got, we've got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of shares on, um, on posts. I think we're, we're between a lot of them, probably well up to over 2,000 shares, I should imagine. Um, 
but and that will just keep going and keep going and keep going and then they will attract more and more and more and more views as time goes on so you know the more these things are shared the more groups they go into the more they will get seen at some point even with people scrolling through and looking down and that kind of thing so um, I have no doubt that we'll get the attention that we want to get on that and then we'll still be able to raise money on that and that we may still be able to get out of business hello Matt C you know, and then we may still be able to get out of trouble. I don't. I certainly don't mind transferring every single bit of debt that we've got into the ten times the mint fund. I'm happy to pay ten times the money if uh, if we win on anything that I owe. There'll still be loads left over, and I'm not a greedy person. All I want at the end of the day is a house. I don't want five hundred houses. I just want one. You know, don't want two like Mr. Kendrick. I'm not greedy. I just want one. Don't six, don't ten, just want one. So it doesn't matter to me how much money I give away on this ten times a mint fund. It doesn't matter if we sue them and get twenty million quid and I have to pay out eighteen of it. How could I possibly be upset with that? I'd be looking in the mirror going, I'm two million quid better off. That's all I care about. Don't care about the rest. You know, if everybody helps me get that, then they deserve to have it off. So that's why that will stay non-greedy and stay at that price. And I'll keep selling that for as long as I can. And hopefully by the time this crisis is finished, I've raised enough money on that to just whack on the solicitor's desk and say there's enough there to go to court, let's have it. That will be good. So I'm sort of hoping for that, really. Right then. What else was we going to talk about this morning? What else was we going to talk about? Might as well keep it around the sort of bankruptcy issues, I suppose. Because then, uh, fix it all. Where are we on any questions? Will the website be back in future? Uh, I'm hoping so. I'm hoping so. But for now, um, I've probably got too many issues and I think Butch is a bit too busy in our uh, at home to be able to help me at the minute. And I, you know, I don't blame him really. So, uh, anything else that happens now is just happening one day at a time. Uh, I've, got, I've got somebody that's letting me put a couple of things on eBay to try and bring a little bit of money in. But even then, because um, before I took everything off eBay, absolutely everything, I took it off sale. And then I realised, well, hang on a minute, I only need to, as long as I've got a way of transacting something, I only need to take it off sale if I can't, if I can't post it. But for as long as they're doing door-to-door -door deliveries, as long as I can post it by courier, then I can still post it. So I may still have a way of transacting a bit so I'm sort of going down that road a bit um, how's Logan doing Logan is uh, Logan is at home now full time and um, and he won't be doing any work while he's at home so uh, so that's I wouldn't know how Logan is doing because we're, we're not we don't sort of contact each other every day you know um, so I have no idea and I don't know when the next time is that I'll speak to him it goes that way that's how it always that's how it always goes work, business it's always been like that when somebody leaves you think oh well probably you know I mean if I talk to Logan now on the phone we'd probably say things like oh yeah don't be a stranger keep in touch yeah we'll go out for a drink yeah we'll go out for a coffee yeah and you don't you end up not you end up because the relationship has been a work relationship, you you don't you rarely very I find anyway very very rarely do you end up with uh, taking what would have been a work relationship into a friend relationship. Um, an exception to that rule would be John, I suppose, but uh, 
that normally whatever business I've ever done, um, and another one would be Faye, um, but other than that, there's not many people that I've met throughout my life that are still still around, as it were, still part of your friend circle, as it were. You know, there's a few, but not that many. So I don't know, we'll have to see. As far as I know, he's doing okay, which is good. And um, I think his partner is one of the key workers, so his partner still has to go to work. But I can't say 100%. As far as I know, uh, Kelly's okay. I saw a post of hers on Facebook and uh, she was out doing a bit of shopping with her partner. There's a couple of masks on. Sale of masks, eh? I mean, how does, how does a place like China that has 1.1 or something like that, 1.5, one and a half, billion people. There's only 70 million here in the UK. There's like 300 million tops in America people and there's one and a half billion or something like that in China. So how does a country accidentally set off a virus that travels around its own country and travels around the entire world and yet they don't have a problem getting older masks and neither does Japan and neither does South Korea or North Korea even they don't have trouble getting masks in these countries why don't they have trouble getting masks do you think I mean you know, I'm only looking at it from my own sort of layman's logical mind. Why? Well, that would tell me that they probably, if they've spent a fortune making bullets and bombs, they've also spent a fortune on healthcare and masks and all that kind of stuff. Because they've got the production, otherwise, how do they get the masks to all them people? And yet here we are, Bearing in mind that it was the NHS that actually developed the test, the first test, the one that says whether you've got it or not. It's the NHS that developed that test. And yet there are more people around the world using that test than there are in this country. Even though we developed it, we haven't got it. See you later, John. Good luck, mate. Exactly, uh, Mr. Zutikus, they knew it would happen all along. But then again, we've all known it would happen. And who do you, I mean, when the blame starts going on, who are you going to blame? Do you blame the Chinese, which on the one hand, yes, you've got to blame the Chinese, you've got to hold them to account. You've got to hold them responsible for that blame. You've got to hold them responsible for what they've done and what they did and what they tried to cover up. And a lot of countries are going to do just that. There is some bad stuff coming because China ain't going to like the reparations that the rest of the world put on them. And the rest of the world is going to gang up on China. Everybody's got to gang up on China. Even Russia will have to gang up on China if Russia ends up losing half a million people. Because it's no different to a country killing so many of your people. That's what's happened. So there's going to be huge reparations demanded of China. You know, it's not going to be what China offers, it's going to be what the world demands and China ain't going to like it. So you've got huge problems coming there, I think, in the future. You know, things that they're not discussing yet, but they will be. Or they probably are discussing them behind closed doors. But they've got to know what it's going to, you know, England, before England starting, UK, Great Britain, before they start going to China and saying, listen, you owe us this much millions, we need to know how much it is it's cost us. And I reckon this is going to cost more than 25 trillion worldwide. The influenza killed 20 million people. If this killed 20 million people, what kind of damage would that do? So 
there's a quite there is a, a like they're gonna have these questions on who who's to blame for it but like my first port of call isn't to the chinese i'm against what they've done and i'm against their human rights and their animal rights and and the fact that their live food markets are, are open again now they've opened them up again already they've opened up their live food markets it's just waiting for another virus to spread and that's where these viruses are coming from. They're all they're, they're always coming from their live food markets, one way or the other. And and they're and nobody's stopping them doing it. And now they're starting it up again. So I think that's uh, that's going to be hugely problematic. So everybody's seen this coming. The Chinese and the Japanese are so, and the Koreans, they're so uh, in tune and so like in their own minds, oh yeah, it's going to happen again. Not not like us Westerners going, oh yeah, it's going to happen. Yeah, 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 it's going to happen. Should we get some masks in? Oh no, don't bother. But it's going to happen, it's going to happen. Yeah, but should we get some masks in then if it's going to happen? No, 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 don't bother because it's, don't know when it's going to happen. It could be any time, it could be 50 years. Might never happen. But you just said it would happen. Yeah, I know. Well, it will happen one day because the scientists say it happen one day. But, Let's not bother getting ready for it just in case. And even if we spend, I just thought of this yesterday, even if we spend more money on defence, every country spends more money on defence than it does its health service. And then you have to ask the question, well, why? Because if we went to war, then, all right, we'd have all the guns, we'd have all the bullets, we'd have all the tanks, we'd have all the planes and the bombs and the shoot 'em ups we'd have all the kit, but don't that mean that we'll be killing other people and other people will be killing us and other people have got to shoot them up too and they've got the bombs and the bullets and the tanks and the planes and the guns. So they're going to be shooting back at us and we're going to be dying and going into hospital. So shouldn't the hospitals and the bullets, shouldn't the hospitals and the defence, the NHS and the defence actually go up together? Shouldn't they both get the budget? Shouldn't they both get a good share of the budget? You know, because these people are about defending us and shooting other people, and these people are about fixing up the people that these people get shot. So, we shouldn't have beds going down. You know, and and uh, our government will 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 have to account for some blame from all of us, from you, and me, everybody, because they have totally raped the NHS. It's been on a spending cut program for ages we have paid redundancies of thousands of pounds to doctors and nurses because they've been there too long and so it's cheaper to get rid of them and employ a youngster and now after giving them thousands and thousands of pounds redundancies we're calling them back into the health service and paying them again so all of that money that was wasted just absolutely wasted hospitals closed down things like that all that money wasted beds and, and now we've got to buy them back at twice and three times the price. Because all we ever do in this country is flipping well, fix a problem afterwards, never preventative. My dad used to talk about that. He used to talk about people and their plumbing and eating. And he used to say, why does everybody leave it to the winter to get their plumbing and eating and central eating checked and their boilers serviced and all of that? Why does everybody leave it to the winter? Why can't people just do preventive maintenance, you know, and, and get us gas fitters around giving their services during the summer and the autumn and the spring as well as the winter? But that, you know, that's what we do. We fix a problem after it comes up instead of it would have been cheaper to have done it the first way around, done it, done it properly the first way around. The falls economy over the NHS has ended up costing us, what, a hundred times more money than they were trying to save? So a completely false economy, wasn't it, really? Anyway. That's me and my bit of a ramble over with. How are you? What's going on in your world? That's what's going on in mine. And in a minute, I'll go and make a cup of tea and then I'll go back to work. I can't believe I'm working every day. Every day I'm working. 
And the funny thing is, I might end up being one of those self-employed people that can't get any money. <laughs> and I've still got to work every day. Couldn't imagine just leaving everything for a year or six months and not doing anything. It's all got to be tidied up. Everything's got to be tidied away. Shame. I feel quite sad, actually. I look around, see the empty chairs, quiet in here, never been so quiet in here, I miss not having Kelly here, I miss not having John and Logan here, <coughs> pardon me, there are so many aspects to it, I do quite miss, I miss the change sorting. And even then, I don't know if I'd do it now. I certainly wouldn't do it without gloves. Since the government, since when did the government care about the homelessness? There's something going on. I don't trust the government or any government. Something's up. I'm not quite changing the batteries in pigeons, but still. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean... When you consider... That the homelessness and poverty has been fought against for so many years right for as long as i've been alive those things have been fought against and now all of a sudden the money is there to fix all of these problems well not fix all of them problems but the money is there for this unlimited budget whatever it needs to take care of the problem and they couldn't do this with homelessness they couldn't look at people in poverty and people in homelessness. So we're going to throw about somewhere between two and four trillion pounds at the economy and everything and all of this stuff. We're going to throw all that money at it because we're going to give people that, that were on PAYE wage, we're going to give them 80% of their wage because we've got to keep the economy going and keep these people paying PAYE. When they come back afterwards, they'll be paying PAYE again. We'll get all this money back off them. So it all applies to the homeless. They just don't factor it in. If you take a homeless person and you put that person back on their feet and you give them a place of their own and you give them a bit of self-respect and you give them a job, they'll spend the next 30 years paying tax into an economy. You will get what you helped them out with back a thousand times over but we can't help them we can't give them a lift we can't give them a hand up those people that are on the bones of their ass we cannot give them a hand up to help them get on their feet again but we can suddenly give every single rateable business 10 grand in the country knowing full well that Hundreds, if not thousands, of those payments will be unnecessary and don't need to be made. Doesn't matter. We're going to make them anyway. But we can't take a person that's got nothing and we and give them something. We can't do that. There are so many people, like the directors of Bright House Group, that are going to essentially take this country to the cleaners. And that's fine, that's allowed, that's legal, and that's all right. But we can't take someone that's got nothing, that hasn't got anything whatsoever, not even a room to live in. We can't take a person like that and put them on their feet. There is no excuse ever again. Well, when we come back from all of this, there better not be no arguments over poverty. There better not be no arguments over homeless, because there better not be no homeless. How can we go through all of this with all of this amount of money being spent and still have a homeless issue afterwards? If we went to war, we wouldn't survive because the healthcare wouldn't be available. As you say, we've bought the bullets, but we haven't bought the bandages. No. No, we've never put that much store into buying the bandages, have we? 
except when when the health service was uh, invented and for the first 20 years they probably poured so much into it and immediately turned it into the best health service in the world and then and then when they started trying to run it like a business and uh, and selling off bits putting the wrong people in power well there's a um, it applies to a, to some of these decisions as it happens that get made in government. There's a there's a very well known saying in in amongst uh, American service personnel. Why does it take something like this to help the homeless in the first place? I don't know, Angela, but wouldn't it be fantastic if it did? If it did actually take something like this to eradicate the homeless in this country, wouldn't that be marvellous? Wouldn't that be an absolute result at the end of all of this? Great Britain, the place with no homeless. Wouldn't that be marvellous? And yet, it wouldn't surprise me, we have more than 320,000 homeless on the streets at the moment, it wouldn't surprise me for that to double. I don't think we will look after which is why the government are leaving the weakest businesses to go to the wall. So all the self-employed people that started up their self-employment within the last year and therefore have no three years HMRC proof of taxes, those people can't claim the self-employed money. They have to claim um, universal credit. If you don't fall into any of the categories where you can get a grant, then you have to claim universal credit. So separating the wheat from the chaff is, uh, is, is what's going to be going on in this country and worldwide, to be honest. It's survival of the fittest now and you're going to be separating the wheat from the chaff. If you end up with 10 or 20 or 30 million people dead, throughout the entire world that is a big chunk of the population i mean it's 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 not it's small compared to seven billion but it's still big it's still a lot you know i mean losing 10 percent of your population would be us losing seven or eight million and, and, and i always said i reckon we're going to lose between sort of four five and between five and seven million i think between five and eight million people in this country because it wasn't stopped quick enough and because they didn't bring the lockdown in quick enough and because we've still got too many people on the front line. Yesterday I went out to Morrison's to get my prescription and not a single person is wearing a mask. So the security guard standing outside the door with all the people walking past her is not wearing a mask. Um, and although they say you've got this one metre distance, people assume just because there's a metre distance between you and me that we're safe. Well, not really. We could be two metres away, three metres away, but I'm downwind from you. Something comes out of here, if it goes downwind, it can travel quite quickly. So, you know, the metre thing only works in absolutely pristine still weather. It doesn't work in a wind. And we've got nothing but wind at the moment. So the security guard standing outside the shop, no mask. As you go through the main door, you've got a guy in his 60s and his job is to spray and wipe the handles of the shopping trolley of the next person coming in before they're allowed to go in the shop. So first you go past the security guard, get in the shop, clean the trolley by a guy in his 60s with nothing more than a scarf around his face right so you've got someone who is the most vulnerable according to statistics and our government absolutely classed as the most vulnerable in our society for this illness and there he is you can't be any more on the front line than the second person that, that every person walks past Every single person walks past this guy and he's standing there in his own little bit doing this. And he is not one metre away from you when you walk past him. So every single person that walks into that 
supermarket is going to walk past this guy in his 60s with just a scarf over his face. And then I walked into, so then I walk along the corridor and I go to the pharmacy. Not a single person in the pharmacy, this is a chemist for Christ's sake, not a single person in that pharmacy is wearing a mask or gloves. No mask, no gloves. Because they've got none. They've got none. I mean, how can they not have any? They've got none. And this woman that's serving me is in her 50s or 60s. And I'm standing there. Oh, Chris, honestly, I'm standing there. I'm talking to this lady. And that's all I could think of was cannon fodder. That's it. All I could think of was what I was saying the other day about chucking all these expendable people in the front line. Let them go over there and take the bullets. And I just, I just, I just need, I started to cry there and then as I was talking to this woman. It's just, I found it really emotional. You know, I was looking around and, and I was looking at the people on the tills. Not a single person has got a pair of gloves on. Not a single person is wearing a mask. There is no way that those people can do their job at the till and not catch the virus or not have the virus come into contact with them. There is no way that can happen. There is so much metal touched by so many people and they're all standing in front of you and you're touching stuff that they're touching. I was really worried about John because um, John, John's wife works filling the shelves and his daughter has also works in Morrison's. So his wife and his daughter both work in Morrison's. And I was really worried about him because I was thinking, well, it's all right, you're self-isolating at home and all of that business, but you've got two people in your household that are on the front line. They're just going to bring the virus back to the house and kill you. Simple as that. And um, But what they've done, apparently, is that Morrison's have said they're one of the people that have said, if you have a member of your household that is one of the one and a half million and is self-isolating, then you can go home on poor pay, which is really nice. So that's like help them out. But that's probably saved John's life, I think. I think without that action by Morrison's, I don't think John would survive this because the two of them are on the front line. So it's almost, you. I mean, it's about as guaranteed as guaranteed gets that John is going to catch that and it will kill him. And so just a simple thing of them going, yeah, you can go and stay at home on full pay because John has probably saved John's life. So that's, you know, that's marvellous. But they're not talking enough about it and they're dodging the questions put to them by the reporters. Every time the reporters put these questions to them, they dodge the questions and they come back with the same regurgitated answers. They're not, they're not answering what they should be. So, so we're all sort of led to believe, oh, things are starting to work, aren't they? You know, you're, you've, got the, you've, got the, uh, you've got the government saying to you, yeah, things are starting to work now. Yeah, we think we're going to get to the, we think we're going to get to the, we're not going to get to the peak like that. We're going to get to the thing like this and blah, blah, blah. And, um, and I think it's going to go boom. I just think it's going to be an explosion. Because I can't logically see how you can have so many frontline people. When, when, when I say frontline people, I'm talking about anybody that you can think of that has any kind of face-to-face -face contact with people. So anybody in the healthcare profession, anybody in what's left of the retail profession, whether that's food, dog food, whatever, you've got people getting angry and spitting at shop service staff you've got you've got people spitting at the uh, paramedics and the nurses and the doctors and things like that you've got these idiots these scrotes these these people that don't even deserve the existence that they've got doing all this kind of stuff and all of this all of this treatment all of this public spiritedness all of this customer service all of this everybody working and everybody carrying on work 
without protection is just, there's going to be a boom. So up to now, you've been told, everybody's been told, if you've got the slightest bit of infection, go home, self-isolate. Only now are they saying, and make sure that you're in a separate room and everything else. So all those people that went home, I know it's logical, I know it makes sense that if someone's got it and, and, and you've got it in the house, that you stay away from them. But there's an awful lot of people that don't understand unless you specifically spell it out from there are people that just don't understand and what about all the people that we've put care back in the community care in the community let everybody go and live in the community that has special needs and isn't quite there and with the same understanding as the rest of us let just let them all go and, and the community can look after them well who's looking after them all now when they don't understand you know so the week the week from the chat is what is going on survival of the fittest and you are watching it unfold in front of your eyes from every country in the world the only thing they can do now same as every other country is ask us to stay at home and uh, try not to spread the virus and if you've got it well you know we'll bring you to one of these makeshift hospitals and try and make your last moments as comfortable as possible and that's it I order everything and wear gloves when I'm packing. The only thing is my prescription. Other than that, I don't leave. Last night, I ordered a pizza. Because we were thinking about what we're going to have to eat. And, and I'm starting to now look at that and think, well, hang on a minute. Let's think about this. I'm not really happy about having a Chinese at the moment for a couple of reasons. One, this is what was going through my head. This is the conversation that we had just for having bloody dinner. Do you know what I mean? It's just like, should we have a takeaway? Normally, you go, yeah, or no. Nice and easy. Oh, no, not now. Now it has to be a flipping full-blown, a full-blown, you know, uh, diplomatic flipping... debate so shall we have shall we have takeaway so i'm thinking about well i don't want a chinese i don't want a chinese because a i'm wanting to take a personal stance over the live food and everything in china and i know the people serving me chinese locally and nothing to do with what's going on in china but it is their culture and how do i know that the food that they're cooking me is the kind of food that's been treated the way that I would want it treated, even though I'm not too sure how I would want it treated, but I know I wouldn't want my food treated the way that I've seen the pictures where they've got them all hung up on strings and they're still alive by the skin of their teeth and all of that. I don't want that kind of treatment on my food. Don't think animals should be treated that way. That is just inhuman, it's disgusting. And you don't know. I, I actually don't know. Then there's this other thing of, I think the Chinese are gonna, a lot of Chinese people are gonna take a lot of backlash. A lot of backlash off of uneducated idiots that wanna blame people over here for something that's happening over there. Bit like me, what I just did. And then, so it's like, you know, oh, this is just all too complicated. I just don't think ordering a Chinese is a good idea right now. What about a curry? Well, I don't want to order a curry because, because the plastic pots tend to come from the Chinese. The curry tends to be the aluminium metal pots. And the virus lasts longer on metal. It's the one thing that's ingrained into us. So I'm thinking, oh, I don't really want, I don't want that. Because now I've got to wash all the pots. I'm thinking, so I didn't do that. But then I'm thinking, well, what do we have? What, do we, what, what, what about, uh, what should we have? Um, what are our other choices here? Kebab. Suddenly, I don't know why. But a kebab just wasn't doing it for me either. Too much, too many things that can be touched with the hands. 
<laughs> this is all going through my head while we're trying to have just a normal conversation about what takeaway to have. And in the end, I'm like, and I've examined all of them, and I'm like, it's got to be a pizza. And the reason for a pizza is because they wear gloves when they're making the pizza and they're putting all the toppings on. They no longer do that by hand. They do actually wear gloves to do it. So they're making the pizza with gloves. And then on a dirty grate spatula, it goes in the oven. And on a dirty grate spatula, it comes out of the oven and into a box. And the only thing they're touching is the box. So that's what I settled on, was a pizza. And then when the pizza arrived, I then uh, got a cloth and wiped all the boxes before opening the boxes to eat the pizza. And then tried really hard. And then washed my hands after I'd opened the boxes and then washed my hands after I'd had me dinner. You know, how far do you take it? Where, where, what extremes do you go to? How far are you thinking about it? Because yes, on the one hand, touching metal is the most dangerous because it lives on metal longer, apparently 12 hours. How long does it live on clothing? How long does it live on plastic? If somebody's got the virus and they're giving me my bottle of Coke that hasn't been opened, but it's still giving me my bottle of Coke with my pizza, um, add, and then I take that bottle of Coke off him, thank you very much, could that be a transference of the virus, just like that? Because maybe it doesn't have to be on plastic long, but it's just come out of his hand into my hand, so that ain't gonna be long. So now, of course, depending on where that puts you in your head, it's like, well, now you've got to wash your hands and maybe even clothing or whatever after every after every interaction. How far do you take it? So like the courier knocking at the door, puts a parcel down on the doorstep, stands back, rings the bell, stands back. You open the door, get the parcel, bring it in. Man will do the beep or sign it for you so you don't have to touch it. That's all very well. But he's just touched the parcel and you've just touched the parcel, taking it off him. And on that parcel is cardboard, paper, plastic. So how long does the virus live on that? Because he's only just put it down on the floor, hasn't he? He's picked it up out of the van and he's put it on the floor. Because it would be a little bit irresponsible for us to assume that every single, just because you're a pizza delivery man, just because you're a courier, just because you work for the Royal Mail as a postman, you're not going to catch the virus. You're immune. No, it doesn't work like that. It attaches everybody. It doesn't care. So therefore, delivery personnel will start going down our flight. Because when the man the courier driver who isn't wearing a pair of gloves, why would he not even have his own gloves on? I've got my own pair of gloves. I don't need a hospital pair of gloves. I go out, I put my gloves on. Courier driver comes to my house to pick up a parcel. I'll put the parcel on the floor and he thinks he's being safe. I'll step back. He will pick the parcel up and go and carry it and put it in his van. Now, unless he immediately hand sanitizes his hands and washes his hands. He's just touched a parcel within seconds of me touching it. 30 seconds, 60 seconds of me touching it. I could have the virus, he doesn't know. So couriers are going to catch it. They're gonna catch it and then they're gonna give it to the next person they deliver a parcel to. If that person is not careful and doesn't wash their parcel and take those kinds of precautions. Do you take precautions up to a certain degree there, but not bother with precautions over there? Where do you draw the line on these precautions? I don't, I mean, we, we have a personal debate going on with me and Fran over walking the dog. I would prefer not to take the dog out at all. And I get it that Fran sees that as cruel. It's like, no, that's cruel. We've got to take him out. We've got to let him have his little run around and stuff. We've got a big garden, but He's got to have his little run around and stuff. And I agree with that. I totally agree with her. She's absolutely right. But on the other hand, how far do you want to take it? Because what if he goes and licks a metal post that someone else has touched that's got the virus? What happens then if he gives me the virus when he comes licking at me? 
and I haven't realised and didn't wash my hands. Whatever, it's so easy to transfer these things. Cats apparently can transfer the virus, so you know the cat won't get sealed, but it get get the cat won't get ill, but it will transfer the virus to you. And the cats, cats are not cats are not kept indoors like dogs are. Cats are just let wherever you want. So with all the people on the front line, with all the people in the supermarkets and retail and and anything you can think of, couriers. Nurses, doctors, all of these people. We just had a consultant die. What a waste. What a waste. That man didn't need to die. He didn't need to die. All he needed to have was protective equipment. And he was one of the first. So he should have had it. You can't tell me that this virus kicked off in this country and we didn't have a single mask. A single... That store anywhere they keep asking them the question why are we so woefully inadequately supplied with all of this stock and then you look at the amount of politicians that have had an, an unbelievable amount of money and that's what the rules that have been set up are designed to do it's to look after the people that have got the money if you look at the, the new rules, if you look at what they're doing, apart from the 80% salary, which they've got to do, they've got no choice but to do that. You know, if you don't pay people to stay at home, then society will break down and you'll have people running through the sheep with, streets with machetes. It's only the fact that we have a police force, we have an actual society and we have an army, etc. And it's all a democratic one, not a dictatorship that stops all of that happening common decency and all the rest of it it soon breaks down when society breaks down and it only takes a week one single week for it all to start going tits up that's what I think anyway that's why you're here so there's a lot of that to come and it bothers me it bothers me a lot it does it bothers me an awful lot all these people that are on the front line, that front line is going to explode. And then when those people come off the front line, you've got to replace them all. It's a lot. So there we go. So there's a couple of thoughts that I've been having. I don't know as you uh, I don't I, I don't know if any of you have been thinking along the same lines as whatever. Don't know, but that's mine. Right. So Stephen McManus, have you? I oh know. I'm gonna let's go back a bit. Have you heard about the rainbow in the window thing? No. Tell me about that. How do you know that the person who cooked your pizza wasn't carrying the virus? That's the thing you don't know. You don't know that the person, and that did come into my mind last night, Stephen. You don't know that the person cooking the virus, uh, cooking the pizza, whether they've got a virus or not. But now I'm imagining that in my head, right? So I'm imagining the man in the kebab shop, cutting the kebab, putting the kebab in, in, the, in the pit of bread, getting the salad, putting it all in. If that man's got the virus, that whole production of that kebab, somewhere along that production line, in order to get that all in the kebab wrapped up, yeah, it's gonna come off him and it's gonna go on my food, if he's got the virus. I cannot see the way that that whole production line of making a kebab goes into force and happens. If a person's got the virus, it's not gonna get on that kebab, can't see that. So that discounted the kebab for me. Gone. The reason for the Indian I gave you, and the reason for the Chinese I gave you. So where I am, down here, that only leaves me two options. One is Thai food, which is absolutely delicious. And the other is pizza. I ain't got no other options, really. And when I thought of it with a pizza, I thought, if the man with the cooking the pizza, what if he's got the virus? And I'm, I'm imagining it in my head. And I'm thinking, well, he's got the blue gloves on because I've seen them with the gloves on when they make the pizza. 
So they're making it with gloves on, even if he's got a virus, he's using the gloves. Then the pizza goes in the oven. So if there is any virus on that pizza, that oven is gonna kill it. And when it comes out, he's half a meter away from that with the, with the spatula. And it comes straight out of the oven and straight in the box. To me, that's got to be the safest. To me, that's got to be the safest of the lot. Even though I prefer Thai food over pizza any day of the week. To me, elementary pizza has to be the safest from a takeaway point of view. All the others come with too many interactions. They come with too many bits and pieces for my liking. There's too many things that have got to be done and touched and one thing or another, and they don't all wear gloves. But when you go to a Domino's pizza, it is standard. They have to have gloves on. So at least I know I'm safe there. So that's where I am on that one. Popcoin says, Ian, I am dark skinned as you know. I didn't know that. I've now got white hands. I've never ever washed them so much in my life. <laughs> I didn't know you was dark skinned. Didn't know that at all. Maybe you told me one day and, uh, and I forgot. But um, yeah, didn't realize that. Because when I talked to you, this is gonna sound really bad. <laughs> I don't know what I'm going to say now is going to sound really bad because I come from that kind of an era, really. Talking to you on the phone, you sound white, which is a really, which as I know is a totally non-PC comment to make. I know it's a really bad comment to make because, you know, how does a dark-skinned person sound dark? Or how does, you know, it's stupid, but... You do, you get these mental pictures of people, don't you? You talk to someone, you get a mental picture of someone's age. Sometimes I'll, I'll be talking to somebody and I might get a mental picture of their age of sort of early 20s and I think I'm talking to someone in their early 20s and then I might meet them and find out they're 52. And I think, oh, that didn't go. You know, so. But I promise I'm not a racist or anything like that. I just will say things that tend to, you know, I come from that era. I come from the racist era as it happens um, and in fact uh, I remember programs like Love Thy Neighbour which oh my god if you've never seen Love Thy Neighbour and therefore watched it now as somebody of say a race or a mixed race person you'd be looking at that in disbelief going oh my god was that really on English television you know, 70s and all the rest of it. My brother's black. So we have mixed race in the family because um, my my mum and dad are white. Um, I have two brothers, Russell and Nick. Russell, we both have the same dad, until he died. And my mum, uh, me and Nick, both had the same mum. Pardon me, so Nick was black, I'm white. And we had that sort of growing up in, um, what would that be, 1970? I left in 76, 77. 76, 77, I left London, went to live with my dad before I then left school at 79. So it was around sort of 70 to 76, those, those years. Anyway, I don't know why I digress on all of that. Oh yeah, because he was washing his hands. Yeah. And that sort of made me immediately think of those people that have got like dark hands, dark skin hands, and then you've got those white blotches, almost like somebody's dropped bits of bleach all over them. You know, and on one hand they're dark all over it, but then they have these white blotches. This must be an even harder, this must be an even harder thing for people with germ OCD to deal with when normal life can seem so impossible for them to function in. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I should imagine there are some people that this would just tip over the edge of whatever over the edge is. 
and there are some people that perhaps it, perhaps it might be a good thing and help them but yeah there's a lot of people going to need a lot of help and they ain't going to be able to get it domestic abuse through the roof the next 12 months will have 10 times the domestic abuse incidents 20 times than there was in the last year domestic abuse is going to go through the roof child abuse is going to go through the roof there are now people pretending to be from companies that are doing testing that are doing testing knocking at people's doors then getting in and robbing them what is wrong with people well that's the easy one to answer that is angela see the thing is when it comes to robbery and taking what is not yours and taking it just because you want to take it um it's a lot easier isn't it it's a lot easier for some people why should they work and just go in and take it off of somebody else and they've got no morals these are the people that deserve Darwin Awards. These are the people that should not be allowed to re-procreate. They should not be allowed to, to sow their seeds. They should not be allowed to impregnate women. And if they're women, they should not be allowed to be impregnated by a man, either or. They should have their reproductive organs cut out, stripped out, taken out, dented out with a spoon if necessary. But they should not be allowed to procreate and have children. <clears throat> they need to be the end of their line. Apparently people are putting images of rainbows in their windows as a sign of hope and support for NHS staff. Oh, that's nice. Dad from Sunderland, mum from Belize. Belize, where's Belize? Belize, Belize. Belize. Is that more European than black, as it were? So I, I don't know where Belize is without looking it up. I'm guessing. I'm guessing it's Europe as opposed to sort of African or Africa or, or West Indies or anything like that. Belize sounds more like something near Poland or Russia or whatever where best is it or I'm going to make myself look a complete tit like I did the other thing oh it was where I said it wasn't African African American British Honduras Brazil Mexico oh okay so it's more um oh, I say more America then yeah at the bottom of there gotcha Andrew, imagine that OCD at its worst. She didn't leave the house in the first place. Yeah. I mean, there are there are people that are agoraphobic that will be staying at home anyway that have got to got used to living like this. It's a change for a lot of people, and I think personally I'll be all right. I, I can only speak for myself. I can't speak for anybody else, but I think I'll be all right. I think Fran will be all right because we have some experience of this. Not a year, both locked up. But we have experience of spending a year or two together as in day and night, we have that experience. And we have the experience of my illness and so on, so it's not gonna be as hard, I don't think. It's probably the hardest thing for me to do is to come on here every day and talk to you for two hours. That's the most difficult thing for me to do in my entire day. But sometimes I come on here and I think, what am I going to talk about? What am I going to say? Whereas everything else is reasonably easy because that's what I'm used to. My entire life has been spent having, having things taken away from me from as, from as far back as I can remember, from as early an age as I can remember. I've had things taken from me and it's never stopped my entire life it's never stopped um, and all my belongings more than once again and again and again and again you know I mean imagine all your stuff gone anything that you own gone everything gone to the clothes to the point of even your clothes and underpants and socks 
and the little bits of trinkets in your cupboard drawers and all the things you get, like the mess that you get. Very messful, you know. You see that bookcase over in the corner with all the little bits and bobs. You know, like everybody's got in their house, like you've got in your house, bitsies and bobsies here and bitsies and bobsies there. Imagine, imagine walking out of your house right now with the clothes that you're wearing and nothing else and having everything else taken away from you. I've had that happen more times than I can remember. And started again and started again and started again. So to me, this is re this is relatively easy to a degree because I'm used to it. I'm, I'll eat by a train. And what a fucking what a train this is! Eat by a train. Got to deal with it. Got to pick yourself up. Got to dust yourself down. Got to start again. And that's all you can do. You think your life is over. You think your life is finished, but it ain't. I'm looking out there because I can see a postman across the road. You think your life's finished, but it ain't finished. Your life's just starting. It's, it's a new chapter. Today is the first day of the rest of our lives, and tomorrow will be the first day of the rest of our lives, and the day after that will be the first day of the rest of our lives. And all you can do is get up in the morning and... Uh, and at the end of the day, go to bed. Get up in the morning, at the end of the day, go to bed. And just try and make right decisions in between. And that's what's going to happen anyway, so that's what's going to happen to all of us, and that's what's going to happen to you, and that's what's going to happen to me. And it don't matter what problems there are, we've still got to do that. That's how I learned to deal with it. there we go that's just me that's me making sense of it in my own mind and dealing with it in my own mind and uh, and we probably there we go look at that where are we um, 110 minutes what's that that's two hours nearly isn't it so have you had fun have I cheered you up have I cheered you up? Have I put a smile on your face? Have I made you all happy again? It's coming in and seeing Uncle Ian. Made you all happy. Cheerful. You could just sit there looking handsome, Uncle Ian. That's it. That's what I try and do. I try and get here presentables. I even, did you notice? I even got the scissors out and I cut the stragglers look. No stragglers. Did that for you, I did. Did that just for you, I did. Make myself look all handsome, sexy. Look. See? I mean, it's a good job I can't go out. I can't tell you how difficult life is sometimes, being the object of women's desires. I mean, going out and just getting accosted everywhere I go. You know, so I have to stay here most of the time for my own safety. I mean, I don't know where I'd be now if it wasn't for my mids. I used to scrub my hands as a child, literally, until they were red raw and cracked. I had to wear special gloves at night to repair them. Ooh, nasty. Well, you've got to look after that. You've got to look after yourselves, you have. Well, I'm going to go now, then. So, time to go, make a cup of tea. Time to get a smoke and a crumpet, as in crumpet. I like my crumpets, toasted crumpet, butter and marmite. Best fit. Oh no, I've just had something to eat. I had yesterday's pizza. <laughs> Fran thinks I'm a nutcase at the best of times. <laughs> so there we are, right. I'll see you tomorrow. Um, anybody wants to come over and join the VIP Supporters Club B, please do. I don't know, Chris, if you've got a, a link for that by any chance. Um, thanks for popping in and seeing us. Thank you, Chris, very much just for being there. Thank you, Popcoin. Thank you, Soundwave Man and Angela and 
Nanny and Judith and everybody else I haven't mentioned. And um, I'll see you tomorrow. Give us a, a thumbs up if you're uh, before you go. And there it is. If you want to join us on a VIP group and go for one of these 1,000 shares, come and join us. All right, and you'll speak to Richard. Hit there and you'll speak to Richard. All right then. Thanks a lot. Very, 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 very much. And uh, lots of love from my bucket. Thank you, Jason, very much. And uh, see you soon. See you tomorrow.